Hello everyone, I'm Alex Stoller, work for Stress Engineering. And I've been working here for about six years and during that time have been uh, fortunate to be involved in a lot of the Coke Drum health monitoring activities, um, collecting and analyzing the data and producing uh, reports regarding remaining life and, and drum health. So what I'm gonna present today uh, along with a colleague is uh, some general trends we've observed on the influence of the inlet configuration on that Coke Drum health. And uh, the, the data we'll be presenting here is based on observations uh, as well as some computational modeling. Uh, and all of them are based on health monitoring data that we've collected over the years uh, from a variety of operators, uh, multiple refinery locations for each operator, and multiple drum types. So in particular, we're going to focus on the Coke Drum inlet configuration. Uh, the three main types that we'll be referring to here will be the conventional uh, bottom fed design. Uh, which was <clears throat> common for a, a number of years, and then with the uh, with the automated automated unheading systems, uh, single side or dual side inlet configurations became much more common. And so we have uh, again been fortunate to be able to monitor drums across many operators and refineries, and so we've collected uh, over a period of years uh, a reasonable subset of data for each of these three drum types that we can use to make some general uh, observations on trends uh, and effects of those inlet configurations. This data is going to be primarily based on strain and temperature data for sensors that have been installed on these drums. Uh, the figure in the middle shows a typical uh, configuration for those sensors. So we have two high temperature strain gauges and they, and they are oriented axially and in the hoop direction. And then we additionally have at least one or possibly two thermocouples installed at those locations to monitor the temperature along with the strain. Um, and that's that data is also used to correct for any thermal effects um, in the strain gauge output. So the effects of single side and dual side has been um, studied to some extent in the past. Uh, this is actually a paper that we uh, presented a few years back, uh, but it was limited to a single site um, a single operator, a couple of different drums, and it was temperature only data. Um, but as a, as a general summary, what this study found was that the single side inlet had higher thermal rates during quench. Uh, there was not a large difference in the thermal rate during fill operations. And it, uh, the single side inlet also had larger circumferential temperature differences, uh, which would be the difference in temperature, for example, between north and south or east and west on the drum. So what we've had a chance to do uh, with some data that was collected over the last five years or so is to sort of expand this to a much larger set of drums across multiple operators, uh, again, multiple refineries and, and many, many coke cycles for each of these drums. And so I'm gonna present some plots here that will compare average data for bottom feed configuration, which will be shown in red, uh, single side inlet configuration, which will be shown in green, and then the dual side inlet configuration, which will be shown in blue. And this first set is gonna focus on the skirt locations. And so what we see here, uh, again, not a, not a huge surprise here, is that the single side inlet tends to have the highest thermal rates during the quench operations, and to a lesser extent, but still present there during the fill operations. Um, so just to walk through this plot really quickly, the x-axis is showing the thermal rate, the rate of temperature change, during either quench, which would be a cooling rate, so that would be negative, or during fill, which is a heat up uh, change in temperature, so that's positive. And then the vertical axis here is the cumulative probability of a thermal rate of that magnitude occurring on a given coke cycle. Uh, so as an example, in about 45% of cases of coke cycles, the thermal rate during quench on a single side inlet drum for the drums that we have monitored and have been included in this data set uh, is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. And you can see that the, in general, the probabilities of those larger thermal rates is much greater compared to a dual side or a conventional bottom feed inlet. On the fill side, again, the, the differences are a little bit smaller, but again, the single side tends to have a higher probability of having thermal rates in the 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit per minute range, as opposed to the conventional or the dual side inlet. Moving up to higher locations on the drum shell, uh, the trends are much less consistent. 
uh, there's much more overlap between the different inlet configurations. So again, as we move away from that inlet location, we move higher on the drum shell, the effects on the thermal rates and the heat up rates is mitigated simply by the distance that's, that we've traveled uh, between the uh, inlet and that location where we're monitoring. Some other notes on thermal rates. Um, again, typically we see much more asymmetry with a single side inlet. And so these are a couple of examples from a particular drum. Uh, on this particular drum, the inlet is located on the south side, which is shown in blue. And then you see northeast and west there. So during, uh, for example, a typical switch in and heat up, we see that the, the blue line, the north, the south inlet location tends to lag a little bit in the uh, thermal heat up rate. And again, that would make sense because we're blowing that inlet feed in the opposite direction. And we see on the skirt, we see that the north side, which is the direction in which the feed is flowing, is the first to heat up um, and heats up more quickly as, as compared to the other three quadrants of the drum. Moving over to the end of that cycle, we're now uh, at the end of coking and beginning to introduce the quench water, we can see that the blue line, the south inlet side, has stayed much hotter throughout the course of the coke cycle, whereas the northeast and west have cooled significantly. So this can be attributed to the buildup of coke along the wall of the cone or the skirt and uh, acting as, as an insulator and causing that drop in temperatures. Whereas at the inlet, because it's had that flow, it in this, at least in this particular drum and the, the flow patterns that have developed inside of it, uh, has not had the opportunity to coke up and, and build up an, an insulate and layer. And so when the quench water is introduced, that location is starting out at a much hotter temperature and cools much more quickly upon the introduction of the quench water. Whereas the other three quadrants of the drum have a much more gradual uh, change in temperature. And you can see some of the same effects up on the skirt. Again, the south side, which is nearest the inlet, is the highest temperature at the end of the coke cycle and the quickest to cool, whereas the other three have a much more gradual trend. And so this has the potential for creating localized temperature differences that can produce a high thermal, thermal mechanical stress and produce damage in the drum. Large scale temperature or thermal gradients are also common. Uh, so again, this is a similar uh, uh, an example of a couple weeks worth of cycles from the same coke drum. Again, the south inlet location is shown in blue. And what you can see here is consistently from cycle to cycle, the uh, that south side is staying hot throughout the cycle, whereas the other sides are coking up and, and decreasing in temperature. So that by the time we get to quench, there's a pretty large temperature difference on the order of 300 or so degrees at the time that the quench water is introduced, uh, at which time the south side cools very quickly. And so you see a consistent cycle to cycle, a thermal difference that can produce a high stress condition um, and quickly accumulate damage on a drum. And those differences can also persist to higher elevations on the drum. So this is an example of the circumferential temperature difference. So again, north to south or east to west across the drum at various weld courses or circumferential welds uh, increasing in height from the skirt. And the pink line that we're highlighting here is uh, about three courses up from the skirt. And these are roughly 12 or 14 foot courses. So we're talking about 36 plus feet. And the, the temperature differences from east to west or north to south on that differential weld are consistently in the 300 plus degree range. Um, and so with the angle of the inlet and the flow patterns that develop during the cycle uh, on this particular drum, they're resulting in large scale temperature differences even at higher elevations on the skirt uh, that can be potentially very damaging. Uh, moving on from temperature to look at the actual stresses and strains that occur in the drum. Uh, so again, same color conventions here with red being the bottom feed, green being the single side inlet, and blue being the dual side inlet. This plot may be a little bit more surprising. So we're showing two quantities here. We're showing the maximum tensile stress in the solid lines, and we're also showing the total stress range on a per cycle basis. So the total range from uh, tensile to compressive, for example, is shown in the dotted lines. Uh, in terms of the 
peak tensile stress, the single and dual side inlet perform pretty similarly. The uh, single side inlet has a tendency for a little bit higher peak tensile stresses, but overall pretty similar performance to the dual side. Both have a tendency for higher stresses compared to the conventional bottom feed. In terms of the total stress range, however, the dual side inlet is actually the uh, by far has the highest stress range on average per cycle uh, as compared to either the conventional or the single side inlet configuration. So uh, both of these stresses are damaging. Again, tensile is what grows a crack, but the total range is what affects the overall fatigue life. And so even if the tensile stress may not be any higher than what you had on the single side inlet, but if it's cycling between that tensile stress and a lower compressive stress, you can get more fatigue damage as a result of that. And so again, among the drums we've monitored, the, uh, the dual side inlet at the skirt tends to have a large stress range per cycle, and as a result, higher damage rates. Moving up to the shell, again, the, the differences get smaller. Uh, again, we're showing the same two quantities here. We're showing uh, peak tensile stresses in the solid lines and the stress ranges in the dotted lines. And what we can see is a lot of overlap in terms of the total stress range. In terms of the peak tensile stress among the drums that are included in this data set, the conventional bottom feed drums actually have a little bit higher probability of uh, higher peak stress conditions. Uh, some of that may be due to the simply the age and the condition of those drums. So in general, if we are monitoring a conventional bottom-fed drum, it will tend to be an older model uh, that has been operating for a longer period of time, whereas most of our single-side and dual-side inlets, again, tend to be on younger drums with less operating history. And so the condition of the drums may not be equivalent among the data that, that you're seeing here. That may be why we're seeing higher stresses again. Uh, on average for the conventional bottom feed. But overall, the, uh, again, the effects are lessened as you go up on the drum shell as compared to the skirt and cone locations that are closest to that inlet. So just in summary, um, those are some of the trends that we are seeing in terms of the effect of inlet configuration on the drum health. And I wanted to uh, just highlight this as one of the benefits of health monitoring system beyond uh, simple life prediction and remaining life assessment. Um, we can also use that data to inform decisions such as these on what type of inlet configuration to install on a future drum. Uh, is it worth changing your current configuration uh, to try to mitigate some of these asymmetric uh, flow conditions? What are the, the costs and benefits in terms of the remaining life assessment on the drum if you're considering some of these changes? And then it can also provide input for or validation of computational models for stresses and flow patterns. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to a colleague who's going to walk through a case study where we did exactly that, taking health monitoring system data on a drum and using it as an input to a computational model uh, to model the solution for a problem that a, that a client was having. Hello, my name is Philip Loya. I am an engineer in the plant services practice. Uh, for Stress Engineering Services out of Houston, Texas. I have been with Stress Engineering for approximately 11 months now, and I have a previous background in history in refining in both fixed, refining and chemical in both fi fixed equipment, uh, mechanical integrity, process engineering, and minor operation roles. Thank you, Alex, for that overview. Uh, I will now be presenting on the case study on the use of monitoring data as input to a computational model. The case study I will be covering is a cone weld cracking. Our background is we had a client had a coke drum with a side feed inlet configuration that developed a crack at the weld joint between the original cone and the transition spool that was added to accommodate a bottom unheading device. So these drums are approximately 50 years old and the transition spool had been in place for about 10 years. The crack developed on the same side of the drum as the inlet feed directly over the inlet nozzle. There has There is a sister drum at this facility that developed a crack five years ago at the same location, but this was attributed at the time to an overpressure event. Stress Engineering Services has a health monitoring system on this drum and that's been in place for the past three years. And there were no recent overpressure events that were recorded throughout the monitoring and reporting timeframe. Given that these two drums had experienced cracks in the last five years and that there are other drums that are not yet to experience this damage, 
The client was interested in determining if this damage was occurring due to a one-off event or if the damage is a result of normal operating conditions in order to develop a repair strategy going forward. The cone to transitions pool was modeled using finite element methodologies. And here is an overview of our finite element model and the subsequent model meshed. The material designation that was used in this, in this model was the original cone and the transition spool and the inlet nozzle were, were all of grade one and a quarter chrome grade 11. The cladding had an original liner of 410 stainless steel and the transition area weld, the transition spool and the ID of the side inlet nozzle were all clad in Inconel 82. The first step in the stress analysis was to determine the stresses from the internal design pressure. From this model, we're able to see that at the location of the transition weld between the cone and the transition spool, the stresses at the weld are about six KSI on the ID and slightly lower on the OD where the crack initiated. Therefore, it is unlikely that internal pressure is the cause for weld cracking. The next step was to model the stresses due to the piping loads. From this model, we were able to determine that the piping loads are far enough away from the weld to have a minimal effect. So therefore, it was determined that it is unlikely that any piping loads were the cause of cracking. Stress engineering had installed thermocouples over the elevation of the, of the coke drum. And from this schematic, we were able to show where the location and placement of these thermocouples were relative to the elevation of the coke drum. And you were able to see that we put thermocouples on the bottom cone and then at multiple elevations across uh, the elevation of the drum. These were placed in the north, south, east, and west side of the drum. Using the placement of the thermocouples, we we're able to go back and check the temperature profile over multiple cycles over a three-year time frame. This slide shows the 2019 average temperature profile over 10 cycles. The top plot shows the temperature profile of the cone with the north, south, east, and west thermocouples, and the bottom plot shows the skirt weld with the north, south, east, and west thermocouples. From these figures, we were able to see that the inlet side of the cone stays hot during the entire fill, while the other sides cool due to the coking on the walls. And this is observed via the blue line, which is the south thermocouple, which stays hot throughout the duration of the fill cycle and the coking cycle, as opposed to the other thermocouples and the adjacent thermocouples. In contrast to the skirt weld thermocouple distribution, we're able to see that the temperatures tend to track fairly consistent and the effect, this temperature effect is less pronounced near the skirt weld. Looking at a second year, in 2018, again, 10 cycles, we're able to see similar behavior a uh, year before the crack developed, where we're still seeing the south thermocouple on the cones remaining at a high temperature throughout the cycle, um, and in contrast to the remaining thermocouples on the three other primary coordinates. And the similar behavior as previously discussed is observed in the skirt weld thermocouple distribution. And again, looking at 2017, a period of 10 cycles, again, similar behavior, and this is also two years before the crack had developed. Looking at the temperature profiles from a different perspective, we were able to plot the temperature distribution on the north and south sides of the drum over a 10-year cycle. The, the plot shown below show the north and south shell temperatures up across the elevation of the drums. And what this plot is showing us is that on the north side, the temperatures increase with height while they stay fairly consistent on the south side. And this is shown that the red line and the red dashed line is the lowest elevation thermocouple in the, in the cone section with progressing to the yellow line, which is the highest elevation thermocouple. Another way to look at this is to look at the average temperature at the end of the fill versus the height. So this is over a three year period. And you, this plot is showing where the bottom X axis is showing the height and elevation where we're seeing the bottom most thermocouple, which is on the cone is five feet below the tangent line. And this thermocouple in contrast to the remaining as you move up 
the elevation of the drum, we're seeing a significant spread and a significant difference in temperatures between the north and the south side. This temperature difference is shown by the dotted lines, the, the dotted line shown on the bottom of the graph, where we're seeing almost 300 and change degree temperature difference between the north and south side on the cone. This slide shows the data that was used for the previous plots. And what we're able to show is that the temperature distribution and the temperature difference is in the 300 regime from the north to south side between the thermocouples and the cone. If we single out a representative cycle and look at the cone temperatures only, again, we're able to zoom in and show how that south thermocouple stays hot throughout the duration of the fill cycle and the overall coke cycle, but the other thermocouples on the north, east, and west side gradually decrease in temperature as a result of coking on the walls. But this also has a much greater effect when the quench cycle happens, such that that south thermocouple, actually the south side actually quenches much faster than the remaining sides, and that effect is much more pronounced on the south side. However, the north side opposite the inlet heats up faster on both the cone and at the skirt at the beginning of the fill, consistent with a south side inlet that impinges on the north wall. Here we show the temperatures during the quench cycle. And if you're looking at the cone, we're seeing a peak difference in quench that's approximately 200 degrees Fahrenheit on the cone. And at the skirt, we're seeing a peak difference in quench that's approximately 275 degrees Fahrenheit near the skirt well. And again, this is a difference between the majority of the thermocouples on the north, east, and west side in comparison to the southmost thermocouple. Using the temperature data obtained from the HMS system, we're able to then generate a model from which we're able to look at the thermal condition and the thermal distribution of the cone and transition spool based on that data. And here we show where at the star locations, are the, the, the approximate placement of the thermocouples on the skirt, the skirt weld, and the cone. On the right side is the north, east, and west axis thermocouples, and those all from the previous plot show to be fairly consistent in their temperature profile. However, the south side thermocouples were shown to be fairly different in that they were remaining hotter and quenching faster. Therefore, those values were put in and on the right side of the cone, where we have the north, east, and west, those values were also put in to be fairly consistent. And the model was used then to define temperatures in the highlighter regions and let the analysis fill in the unknown regions. The resulting estimated temperature distribution is shown in these two models, where we're seeing at the end of the fill, the southmost side, which is also the side of the inlet feed nozzle, is staying hotter and which is and that is shown on the left most plot on the right plot we're seeing the quench cycle where again the left most side which is the side of the inlet feed is also cooling at a much quicker rate and colder as compared to the remaining locations within the cone using the temperature distributions from the previous models, we were then able to back calculate out the stresses and the overall deflected shape due to those thermal gradients, but this is at the cycle extremes. So during the end of the fill process, that transition weld area between the cone and transition spool was experiencing almost 125 KSI of stresses versus at the quench side where we were seeing almost 60 KSI of stresses in that same region. And therefore, when we take the stress range and calculate the stress range over a typical operating cycle, we're seeing a stress range is approximately 182 KSI at the cone weld where the cracking occurs. Now, taking that stress range and using a design curve approach, we're able to calculate out and determine that that, that location only has a fatigue life of about three and a half years. Now, this is a little bit different in such that this is a design curve approach, not a mean life curve approach, which would have resulted in a longer life. However, this is still in the lifespan and in the range because our previous, our previous discussion and our introductory statement stated that the 
operators saw these cracks coming in at about five years to 10 years. And if we were to use a mean life curve approach, that would fall within that range as well. But this is also showing for reference because this is not too far-fetched of a design curve of a estimated fatigue life approach. Therefore, the root causes of this cracking that was occurring on the, on the transition weld between the cone and the transition spool were, are summarized as follows. The effects of piping loads and internal pressure are negligible. Consistent temperature gradient occurs at the thermocouples on the cone from the SES data across the north and south sides, which we have three years worth of data. So the average of 350 degrees from the north to south side during the fill and approximately a minus 200 degree F gradient during the quench. Stress is due to estimated thermal gradient along with the change in angle between the original cone and the added transition spool result in a design life of about three and a half years. Now, as we stated, given the design margin in the design curve, a longer mean life would be expected, but the actual values depend on a lot of factors such as material scatter, weld quality, finish, et cetera. And this scatter could explain why the prior drum had failed at around five and a recent drum at about 10 years. Taking this all into account, we helped develop a repair strategy. Now there's two options in order to improve the stresses at this location. One is to change the flow distribution to avoid uneven temperature profiles across the cone. This is comes in the form of a center feed inlet nozzle or a change in process conditions. Another option is to modify the geometry to be more tolerant of the current operating condition. In order to investigate option two, you need to smooth out the structural discontinuity in the cone angles that is magnified due to the thermal temperature distribution. And therefore, an external weld overlay was proposed to reduce the effect of this change in angle. So if you look at this, the schematics on the bottom, you can see what a proposed weld overlay solution would be. We're using a transition area, a transition to provide roughly a 10 to 1 slope at the end of the weld overlay and then the surface finish ground as smooth as possible. A finite element analysis was used in order to validate and optimize the proposed weld overlay and the extent of the weld overlay. The, the figures below showcase the stresses of seen at a one inch center weld overlay three inch center weld overlay, half inch center one over weld overlay, and a one and a quarter inch center weld overlay. And what this is showing too is you can see that the effects of the reduction in the stresses at that center are not a, are more so observed until once you get into the half inch thick center. And then it increases from there as you go from three quarter to one inch. If we were to plot those as see the effects of the weld overlay depth on the stresses, we can see that in the graph below, where the green arrow that goes across is showing the weld overlay length per the x-axis, which is the weld overlay thickness. But the curved lines, the red, blue, and purple, are showing the stress reduction with the weld increase in weld overlay thickness. And again, we can see that with no weld overlay applied, our points converge at 182, which was the stress range observed with no weld overlay and in the base material in previous studies. As we increase the thickness of the weld overlay from a quarter to half inch to half inch to three quarter and one inch, we can see the stress and the base material reduce from 180 to almost 55 or so. KSI. And another way to look at this is to look, is to plot the approximate damage per cycle versus the various weld overlay thickness values. If we look at the percent damage per cycle based on the weld overlay, this is where we can truly see the benefits of the weld overlay application and the thicker weld overlay giving us a much a much greater reduction in the damage per cycle. And we can see that that reduction in damage per cycle is much is seen at half inch, uh, three quarter, and one inch. Therefore, uh, it was proposed to use a three quarter inch weld overlay thickness because once you get into the thicker weld overlay, the, the gains at that point become marginal. Therefore, in conclusions, the information from the HMS system was vital to determine the, the cause of the cracking and to determine and validate a repair strategy given the relative unexpected temperature distribution in the cone region. 
the cracking in the weld was a result of the temperature variation across the cone due to the side inlet that occurs during normal coking cycles, as well as the geometric discontinuity between the existing cone and the transition spool for the bottom unheading device. From this, this HMS data, we're able to see the temperature patterns are extremely repeatable over three years of operating cycles that were instrumented, likely due to normal flow patterns that exist in the drum that result in uneven development of coke layers on the wall inner diameter. The smaller the difference in the angle between the original and the transition spool, the lower the resulting stresses and the longer life. Therefore, an external weld overlay across the transition region will significantly lower the stresses and extend the life of the cone weld. Thank you very much, and we will now be moving into our Q&A session.